Hi everyone, I'm Christy and you're watching A Fostered Life. And in today's video, I'm celebrating 5,000 subscribers on YouTube by giving you five tips, five books, and five fun facts about me, the host of A Fostered Life. Over the weekend, I learned that I now have over 5,000 subscribers on YouTube and um, and I thought it would just be fun to do something to recognize that there are 5,000 of you who are finding these videos helpful enough to subscribe, and I really appreciate you subscribing. Um, I found out that I had 5,000 subscribers because I was on YouTube looking up one of my old videos to share with someone who had written in to ask me a question. A lot of times people will write to me, and if I know I've already done a video on that topic, I'll track down the video and I'll just send them a link to that video with a note. So I did that over the weekend, and, um, and it was at that moment that I noticed that suddenly I'm over 5,000 subscribers, and that felt like a kind of a big deal, so I thought it was fun. So um, the first thing I'm gonna give you is five tips for people who are considering becoming foster parents or are already foster parents. And some of this you'll have already heard in previous videos, but I just kind of wanted to consolidate some of my best advice into five tips, and the number five is because there are 5,000 subscribers. So um, it's not totally arbitrary. All right, so the number one tip is deal with your baggage. If you're thinking of becoming a foster parent, it's really important that you take some time to work through your own history, your own emotional triggers, knowing yourself and just knowing what makes you tick because all of that will be provoked. And um, uh, if you become a foster parent, you will find yourself needing some tools for your own emotional regulation. And a lot of that has to do with knowing how you're wired. So my best advice is if you don't already have a therapist, schedule some time with a therapist, tell them what you're doing, and just say, hey, can you help me prepare myself emotionally for this journey that I'm about to get on? Um, it's important that the therapist have a trauma-informed background and it would be, it's ideal if the therapist has some experience um, or knowledge of the foster care and adoption stuff. So I'm going to link two people in the show notes below who are both trauma-informed therapists with experience as foster and adoptive parents. Um, they will know the right questions to ask you and they'll know some of the best advice to give you. And if they're not available, they would probably be able to direct you to someone who is. Um, these are folks who can take clients online. You could also look around in your area. Go to psychologytoday.com um, and look up therapists who specialize in trauma-informed care. Make an appointment, explain what you're doing, and ask them to help you start the work of preparing yourself to be in the role of caregiving children who have a history of trauma. You'll thank me later, trust me. My number two tip is make sure that you're talking with your spouse or partner about your, your thoughts about foster parenting. And if you're not both on the same page, namely if you're not both 100% on board with being foster parents, don't do it. My best advice is just don't do it. There are a lot of other ways to be involved in foster care. I will link in the, in the show notes below um, a post that I wrote in response to a lot of questions that I get from people wondering um, about um, other ways to be involved in foster care. If you have a heart for foster care but your partner or spouse doesn't, find another way to be involved to fill that desire in your own heart to serve in that way. But don't put your marriage in jeopardy. Don't um, bring kids into your home where they are going to be the source of strife in your home um, because you're not both on board with it. it, it just it's a, it's a no-win situation and you're going to be hurting those kids even more. So just don't do that. Um, it's important that you're on the same page and if you're not, find another way to be involved. Number three, uh, find your foster parent friends. Um, connect with other people who are foster parents and I recommend having people who are further along in the journey who you can go to to ask questions and people who are around the same place you are so connect with other people in your training and exchange phone numbers and stay in touch in uh, stay in touch with each other because um, 
it's really helpful to have other people who know what you're experiencing and who are going through some of the same things who you can share the journey with. There are things that foster parenting entails, experiences that you'll have that no one else can appreciate or understand except for others who are on the same journey. Make sure you have friends who understand what's happening in your world and vice versa so you guys can be resources for each other, encourage each other, and be there for each other um, when the going gets rough. And to celebrate the things that other people might not see as celebrations. I say in the Flourishing Foster Parent, part of what we do there is we share the trials and the triumphs. There are things that we experience as major victories that other people would look at and be like, what's the big deal? But for the foster parent, some of these things are big deals. And uh, it's really helpful to have friends who understand that some things call for a celebration, even when the rest of the world would look at it and be like, what's the big deal? Okay, um, number four, if you're thinking of becoming a foster parent, make sure you check your motives. Are you wanting to adopt a child or are you wanting to support a child who's in transition and be supportive of reunification? If your primary goal for being a foster parent is to adopt a child and grow your family through adoption, you need to be very real about that and stick with kids who are um, legally free for adoption. There are thousands of children in our country who need adoptive homes. And if your goal is to adopt a child, and that is your primary reason for being a foster parent, pursue those children. Because children who are in foster care, in the traditional sense of foster care, they need foster parents who are able to support their journey back to their family of origin, if that's a possibility. Now, there are those of us out there who are foster parents who are also open to adoption. And that's a great place to be because then you can support reunification and you can get behind the families and the children and all of that. But if the time comes when reunification isn't possible, you can also be their uh, forever home. And that's also a great place to be. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you, you should never adopt a child that you've had in foster care, quite the opposite. I think it's great when a child has been in foster care, is unable to reunify, and is able to stay with the family they've already grown attached to. But if your goal <laughs> is primarily to adopt, because I hear from people all the time and they're like, I want to adopt a child. I've had people say, I want to adopt, but it's too expensive, so I think I'm gonna be a foster parent. And I've told them, please don't. Please don't do it for that reason. Um, because um, when a child comes into foster care, uh, there's a season of time where, where what your best role in this is to be a safe and secure place for the child and supportive of that, journey, that child's journey back home. That doesn't always work out, and then adoption is on the table. But if you go into it hoping to adopt a child, you're really not going to be able to support reunification with any integrity. And it's important that you're honest about that. So um, check your motives. Know, you know, refresh your memory on what foster care is, and uh, and then you know don't confuse foster care with adoption prematurely. I guess that's what I'm saying. Okay, and the last tip I have is never stop growing and sharpening your tools and learning. Um, read books, listen to podcasts, take workshops, take classes, sign up for something like The Flourishing Foster Parent where I'm providing resources every single week to foster parents to help them grow and sharpen their tools, whether it's parenting or interacting with the family of the children in your care or managing the behaviors you know, um, managing yourself, developing self-care plans, um, parenting children with specific needs, LGBTQ youth, children with learning disabilities and neurological dysfunction and all that. We address all of this, trauma and attachment issues. We address all of that in these calls, but there are other places that you can do that. And that's actually gonna take me to the next thing I wanted to share, which is five books that I recommend for every foster parent to have on your shelves and I'm gonna just reach over here to get those. So, um, I have to check the time. I have to get my son in a little bit. Um, okay, the first book that I have, and I actually have a post-it here because I'm about to deliver this to my friend, but this is Wounded Children Healing Homes. And um, uh, this is my number one reading recommendation for anyone becoming a foster parent. 
This book is so helpful. I've given this away to many people. I usually buy five copies at a time and I just keep them and then when I'm running low, like I think this might be my last copy to give away, not the one that has all my notes and things in it. Although I did once give away my copy with all my notes and I had to start fresh. But anyway, um, it's a great book and um, it's a collection of essays by different people. Um, uh, one of the editors of it and authors of it is Jane Schooler. I've heard her speak a lot. She's amazing. If you ever get a chance to hear her teach, I highly recommend her. Um, but this book is great and I highly recommend that you get your hands on it. The second one that I want to recommend is Beyond Consequences, Logic and Control. You've heard me talk about this before if you've been watching this channel. We went through it last summer in The Flourishing Foster Parent. We took seven weeks to talk through this little book. It's a pretty fast read, but what I think you'll find is that you'll highlight a bunch of stuff. Look at how much I've highlighted in there and, and underlined. and um, You'll highlight a bunch of stuff and then you'll go back and you'll read it and then you'll get a couple months down the line and you'll realize, okay, we're back to our old way of doing things, relying on consequences, relying on punishment. Um, you can do those things, but they're not really gonna address the underlying issues. The parenting tips in this book the very practical approaches that they offer here take into account trauma-informed parenting, take into account the fact that when our kids are acting out, it's not, punishment is not going to fix it. You can't punish trauma out of a child. You can't consequence trauma out of a child. I've said to many people, when a child has lost their parents, there's very little other things you can do to consequence or punish them that's going to change anything for them. Um, you might get them to adjust in the moment, like you might threaten them to take screen time and get them to, like in that moment, get their shoes on and go to the car. But if they suffer from opposition defiant disorder, taking away you know, screen time in order to get the, their shoes on to go to the car isn't going to fix the fact that they are still going to struggle with oppositional defiance disorder and the next time they need to get their shoes on, you're going to have this whole thing over and again. Um, Beyond Consequences, Logic and Control gives you a really practical way to address um, the underlying issues going on with our kids and um, help them get to the place of, of stronger attachment and attunement and that sort of thing, which is the goal of parenting, which brings me to this book. This is a brand new book. It just came out. I just got it a couple days ago. I devoured it. Um, I highlighted like every page. It's like so highlighted. Look at this. This is... <laughs> I mean, I might as well have just highlighted every word in the book. It's so fantastic. And the reason it's so fantastic is it's written by Daniel Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson. They've written other things, most notably is The Whole Brain Child, which is also on my list of recommended reading. And um, this book is fantastic because it distills why kids need secure attachment and how to get them there. And this is for anyone who parents, this is, this is for any parent, but for those of us who have children who come to us with damaged attachment, with insecure attachment, getting our minds around this concept that the goal is to help them grow, you know, secure attachments, and then getting our minds around how they recommend we go about doing that is so important. I did a review of this book today in fact it's on my blog today I will link to it below I'm gonna put a bunch of links below I'll put links to all the books anything I recommend in here I'm gonna um, link to below okay here's another one of my must reads the body keeps the score this is your um, deep dive into how trauma affects our bodies, our brain development, our abilities to function cognitively, how trauma affects our physical bodies, illness, um, heart issues, those sorts of things. Reading this book will give you a lot of um, important knowledge and I find that when it comes to parenting kids with trauma, knowledge is power. Um, Knowledge helps breed compassion. If you have a child who is generally making your life very, very challenging, and all you see is the problems, and you can't see the underlying causes that brought them to that place, you will have a real hard time with empathy and compassion for that child. But I have found that by learning about what's going on inside of their bodies and learning about what causes them to struggle in the way they do, it has helped to really grow my empathy and compassion, and it's helped me understand some of these other books, um, both the ones that I've shared here and some of the other ones on my recommended reading list, that 
take into account trauma and then offer practical tips for how to address those with our kids. So it all goes together, knowing all this thing, this stuff goes together, but foster parents need to become lay scholars of trauma. And um, you really can't learn enough and you can't pour enough into your own self both to understand why you are the way you are and perhaps even identify things in your own history that cause you to react the way that you react and identifying your own triggers, but also recognizing it in our kids. Um, the last book I'm going to recommend here is one called um, 20 Things Adopted Kids Wish Their Adoptive Parents Knew. And the reason I recommend this book is that it gives you a perspective from the child's perspective. And this is adoptees, but um, a lot of the things that adopted children experience or adults looking back on their experiences of adoption mirror foster youth as well, especially when it comes to helping them identify who they are and understand who they are um, in the light of being separated from their birth family, separated from the woman who gave birth to them and being raised by someone else. So you could be a stepmother, you could be an adoptive mother, you could be a foster parent or an auntie or somebody who's raising a child who's not your own or uncle or father. I know single foster fathers out there who, who are in the same boat. Um, getting the perspective of the children is so important and I recommend this book and then I have others that are listed on my website that I really highly recommend you check out to really understand and again build compassion and empathy for the experiences our kids have which a lot of times they don't feel free talking to us about because they don't want to hurt our feelings they don't want to ruin they don't want to feel like they're gonna ruin another relationship with another mom a lot of times kids feel um, somehow personally responsible for the fact that they're in foster care or they feel personally responsible for having been adopted. They feel like somehow they weren't enough for their mom or their mom didn't want them enough. Somehow there's just this deep primal wound and, um, and it's really helpful to understand that so we can understand how to talk to our kids and how to help them process their stories and how to give them permission to talk about things. Um, that you know they need to know they can talk about these things and, and not worry about hurting us or worry about how we're gonna feel. Um, we need to support them in their journey. So anyway, okay, those are my five books. And now I want to share five fun facts about me, Christy, the person who is behind A Fostered Life. And I'm doing this because I love when other YouTubers do this. I love learning about people. Um, there are people I follow who do like different theme channels, like, you know, nutrition channels or finance channels or lifestyle things and um, they talk about their topic a lot like I talk about foster care a lot but you know there's a lot of other things behind them and so I love learning fun facts about other youtubers and people who create the content that I enjoy watching so I thought I would just share five fun facts about me that don't have anything to do with foster care the first thing I'll share is that my first career was acting I used to be a professional actor for a little over 10 years, that was my full-time pursuit. Now, of course, I had other jobs. It's, you know, when you're an actor, it's a gig economy for sure. So I worked in coffee shops and I worked as a office temp and I, you know, did executive assistant type stuff. And then I got into public relations and I supported myself doing some jobs in, in that field. But um, I was pursuing a, an acting career for 10 years. I was, I'm a member of Screen Actors Guild. I'm still a member. Um, I got my SAG card when I was 23, um, or I got, eligible, I got eligibility for my SAG card when I was 23 on a show called uh, Legacy on the UPN. It was a short-lived Civil War drama, and I played Winifred, the town seamstress. And if the show had continued on, it would have been a recurring role, but alas, it did not continue, and I only had one episode. Um, but it was enough for me to get my SAG card, which was a big deal for me at the age of 23. Um, I have been in um, many films where I had tiny parts that got even tinier on the cutting room floor. So there are films that I did days and days of filming and none of it ended up in the film. Um, but in those experiences, I worked with some big name actors. Um, and when I say I worked with them, I won't, I, it's not like I had my scenes opposite them, but like I was in scenes that they were in. <laughs> so I was um, like a party, a party goer or, um, uh, you know, 
somebody walking down the street or whatever. So um, I did extra work. I did walk-ons. I had a recurring non-speaking role as a juror on um, As the World Turns for six episodes in a trial scene. I didn't have any lines, but I was in six episodes because I was on the jury. Um, and they needed the same people, you know, and that. So um, I did a lot of theater. My last role before quitting acting for good and becoming a foster mom, my last role was, I think, in 2012. Yes, no, 2013, one or the other. It was before we became licensed. And um, I did um, Steel Magnolias, and I played Truvy. And that's one of my favorite roles ever. It was the last role I did before quitting to become a foster mom. And uh, and I'm not sorry that I quit, but I'm also not sorry for the 10 years I spent pursuing my acting career. I had some amazing experiences. I toured in a theater company several times. Um, I performed on stage at the Ryman Theater in Nashville. Um, the Grand Ole Opry is there. Um, and I shared a dressing room with some very large named uh, um, country stars who I had grown up knowing and then ended up in a dressing you know like a series of dressing rooms where we were all in there together and it was just incredible um, just amazing and um, I was in I've been on stage at Carnegie Hall um, I've had some really really interesting experiences and I'm so grateful for the years that I spent acting um, and I've told my kids I will always support you pursuing your dream you have to work hard, you have to be serious about it, you know, you have to really um, keep your head on straight, but if you wanna pursue a career on stage, a career in music, um, whatever it may be, you'll have my support. Um, but, uh, you know, anyway, I'm glad I did it and, and I'm glad I'm doing this now. Okay, the second thing I'll tell you about myself is that I am an Enneagram 1 with a strong 2 wing. The 1 is the perfectionist or the reformer, and the 2 is the helper. And um, understanding my Enneagram number has really helped me understand even why I'm compelled to do what I do here on A Fostered Life. Um, when I became a foster parent and realized how much I needed to learn and how much I was struggling and how much I needed to grow, I did a deep dive for myself into learning how to be a better foster parent. It's just the way I'm wired, right? Um, I'm a reformer, I'm a perfectionist, and so I wanted to do a better job at being a foster parent. And so I began devouring books and talking with everyone I could and learning as much as I could. But I'm also a helper. I'm motivated by helping other people. So when I recognized over and over through talking with people how many people were in the same boat that I was as a new foster parent, I felt compelled to start creating resources to help other people grow and learn and um, you know, to help support other people. And so my understanding my Enneagram helps me understand why I do what I do here. And it has really freed me up to fully embrace um, the fact that this is something that I love doing and I um, will continue to do even once we're no longer foster parents, which that time is coming soon because we're about to finalize our fourth and fifth adoptions and we will not be continuing to do foster care for a while after we finalize these adoptions. If you, if you know your Enneagram number, please share it below. I would love to know if that's something that you've explored as well. So number three, uh, fun fact, I'm the youngest of three children. I have two older brothers. We grew up in a solidly intact family with very secure attachments. Um, our parents have been married for over 50 years. We had no major huge drama or trauma or tragedies in our life. That's not to say that life was perfect. Every family has their conflicts and has their stuff. You know, we're not perfect by any stretch, but we had a pretty solid secure life to grow up in and my brothers and I are all high achievers um, uh, you know we've all pursued higher education my two brothers both have their doctorate degrees and I'm in seminary right now for a master's degree 
Um, my two older brothers are pastors, so that's kind of interesting too. We're all very involved in church ministry. I'm in the role of um, worship musician. My brothers are both pastors, and um, I, you know, we've we've done things together at different times. Just a couple weeks ago, I was visiting my brother's church in Charlottesville, and I sang at his church. So our our ministry lives have intersected a number of times over the years. Um, but the other interesting thing about my family is that while we were not an adoptive family or um, an adoption and foster care really didn't play much of a role in our lives at all, uh, aside from the fact that I had one distant, kind of distant cousin who was adopted. I mean, he wasn't a distant cousin, but we didn't really like grow up close to each other went past the age of seven or so. Um, but my brothers and I have all been involved in foster care and adoption. My oldest brother and his wife have adopted three children overseas and transracially. And my middle brother, um, uh, he and his wife have two biological children, but they also have, uh, they foster parented for a year um, before I did. So that stream of, of being involved in the world of foster care and or adoption runs strong in my family. And, um, and I think a big part of it that helps is that our parents have been very supportive. So I'm grateful for that. And um, I thought it was worth mentioning as a fun fact in my life. Number four, um, and I have to run through this really quick because I'm going to be late to pick up my son from preschool. But number four is I experience ASMR. And I don't know if you know what that is, but it's audio sensory meridian response. It's the scientific name given to people who experience relaxation or um, pleasant feelings because of different sounds they hear. And I'm sharing that because um, every night when I'm going to bed at night, one of the last things I do is I listen to ASMR channels on YouTube. And um, and it helps me relax. It helps put me into a place of wanting to go to sleep. Now, what's interesting is there's a wide spectrum of ASMR videos, and there are some that are really strange to me, that are really weird, that I don't enjoy at all, and I don't you know, get behind or recommend some weird different role-playing things. But there are some that are just simply gentle whispering, um, little noises, people who talk, who like, will tap on things. Um, I had a hairbrush here a minute ago and I was tapping on that. Um, I don't know, anyway. Um, so there are a couple of channels that I really enjoy and they're, they're just, and it started for me, I used to listen to Bob Ross, The Joy of Painting. And I didn't know why, but like listening to him putting one of his videos on YouTube would help me relax. And I just would listen to him while I was like cooking or, you know, winding down. Sometimes I would go to sleep listening to The Joy of Painting because it just sort of helped me relax. Well, come to find out, Bob Ross is kind of considered the father of ASMR unwittingly. It's not like he did it on purpose. But um, people recognized that there are some people who experience relaxation um, from certain types of noises and if you're one of those people and you're like looking for ways to help you calm your own body down it might be worth exploring again some of the ASMR you know it's kind of weird to me but um but I'll link a couple channels below um, that I find really really helpful and that I enjoy and I'd be curious to know if any of you have discovered ASMR and find them helpful as well and if you do maybe share one of your favorite videos in the comments below that would be really um, fun the last thing I wanted to share today is um, is that a couple years ago I almost quit this whole channel um, I was really struggling with doing foster care videos I was feeling um, uncomfortable for a number of reasons but one of them was I was growing in awareness of the fact that when I'm sharing as a foster parent I'm also sharing my something about my children's story even if it's just the fact that they were in foster care and I feel really protective of my kids um, I feel really protective of their privacy and their right to not have the title of foster care follow them around for the rest of their lives at the same time um, my kids who are old enough to understand what I do here are actually really supportive of the fact that I do this. And they have said they want me to keep doing it to continue providing resources to other foster parents. So it's been pretty amazing to see my kids 
get behind what I'm doing and recognize that um, that all of us together, you know, are contributing to helping other fostering families um, grow and learn how to do it better. So, but I almost quit a couple years ago because a couple things I was, uh, as I already said, uncomfortable about putting, you know, the family's privacy on display, but also, um, I've been trolled a few times. Um, I've had people say really horrible, unkind things. They take things I've said out of context. They've accused me of, you know, being against families or whatever. Um, and I've had to just develop a thicker skin and go, you know what? There's always going to be people who don't fully understand or don't take the time to understand what you're doing. And they're really free with their comments on online because something about being you know, commenting on YouTube just really emboldens people to say, you know, say things that are not not thoughtful or kind. But I'm not doing this for them. I'm doing this for the 5,000 plus of you out there who are watching and who are finding my videos to be really helpful. And um, a couple years ago, and even I think about a year ago, I was wrestling again with like, I think I'm just going to stop this. And I said to my husband, I think I'm done. I think I'm done doing a fostered life. I think I'm just going to shut it all down. And that day, I got an email from someone telling me that one of the videos that I made um, saved their placement that they were about to disrupt because they were just feeling so lost and frustrated and unequipped for what was happening in their home. And they watched my video and they felt um, the confidence to continue fostering. And when I hear things like that and I think about that child who was about to be moved, who the last probably the last thing he needed was to be moved again. He needed to stay right where he was and have the benefit of time that our kids need to um, grow secure attachments and to improve and to get what they need. Um, the stability that, you know, um, when I found out that what I was doing here helped that family and when I, I've had others that have written at just the right time to let me know how what I'm doing here is helping them. Um, I decided to keep doing it. So I am in it to win it. Um, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm going to keep doing this. I recognize the importance of it. I went ahead and started doing the Flourishing Foster Parent as a means of being able to be more involved in people's lives. Um, the Flourishing Foster Parent in, involves weekly live calls um, it has a private Facebook group now where people are interacting with each other, supporting one another, building friendships with one another, sharing resources, commiserating, sharing trials and triumphs. It's just been such a great resource and I love it. And um, there is room for others if you if you would like to join. So I'm putting a link in the notes below about that. So, but yeah, that was just the last fact I was going to share is that um, about a year or two ago, yeah, about two years ago now, um, I was really strongly on the verge of just shutting this whole thing down and just being done with it. And I had to come to terms with um, acknowledging some of the ways that being a public foster parent is hard and sets you up for some criticism and some vulnerability, but also recognizing that I really believe in what I'm doing here. And I think that what I'm doing is helping people. I'm committed to the children, first of all, in foster care. I'm committed to helping educate and support foster parents to do a better job for the kids in our care. And I'm committed to family preservation and, and reunification and helping equip foster parents to be able to support family preservation efforts and reunification efforts when at all possible. So that all goes into it and I'm in it to win it. I'm not going anywhere. So thank you so much for subscribing to my channel. Thank you for watching. Um, yay, 5,000 people. And I'm not really interested in big numbers, but I do think it's kind of great that there are 5,000 of you out there who are checking in to YouTube videos that are meant to help foster parents do a better job for our kids. And that's what this is all about. So thank you for subscribing. Thank you for watching. Thank you for caring about foster care. And I will see you in the next video.